Someone should introduce. Yeah, okay, so uh, welcome everyone. I'll begin. Um, and and uh, I, I'm, I'm just so happy. I, I, so I've got to try not to be giddy. I haven't I've been, I've been able to talk to Paul and JP for a while. JP's gotten married. I mean, it, oh, wow, right? Um, and so just excited to be here uh, with the two of them again. Uh, we're picking up on uh, uh, an ongoing dialogue we've been having uh, around the topic of miracles and related things about intelligibility. Um, and last time um, we came to uh, 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 a question and the question, the argument basically went like this. Um, so in the first uh, episode, JP presented his work on, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, not quite reconciling, but maybe that's a close enough, reconciling the idea of the miraculous with the, uh, with sort of a Neoplatonic view of the intelligibility of the universe uh, and uh, made use of Lewis and other people. And then, uh, and then following Lewis, uh, there was the idea that the central miracle that makes sense of all of the miracles, and JP, jump in if I'm misrepresenting you in any way, yeah, was, sure. the in, was the incarnation. And then I proposed um, discussing, uh, making a comparison between incarnation and enlightenment and the idea that enlightenment could be explained in sort of naturalistic terms and you know talked about people like you know socrates and the buddha and and um and then uh, both paul and jp uh said that it, while it's plausible and perhaps even proper uh, if i'm misremembering uh, please correct me to think of jesus as enlightened um, that there's there's something above and beyond that that goes into the notion of incarnation, uh, which was the idea that the incarnation has an onto, a unique ontological status in that it is uh, redemptive of human history and of uh, of the natural universe in some important fashion. And that's sort of where we left it because I brought up the question that uh, that seems to imply a teleology in history and in the natural universe. And it looks at least prima facie, and I could even bring in C.S. Lewis as an ally here, like the universe does not have that kind of teleology in it. And if history has a teleology, it seems very warped because it seems to lead to places like Auschwitz. Um, and so that's basically where we're at. So first of all, is that a fair presentation of yep. what has happened before? And then JP has, uh, I'm going to turn things over to him because he has recently, uh, well, not that recently, but we, it's going to be recent to this discussion, um, uh, written a, a further response that will be the basis of the discussion we're going to have uh, today. I, I just wanted to say, first of all, uh, before we get into it, I've been very appreciative of these discussions. Um, I think they're, uh, they're, they're, um, they're mutually clarifying in, in, in a very powerful way. Yes, that's true. I really value those discussions as well. And in the response, uh, I'm going to try to outline it. So at the beginning, I tried to get a bit clearer on what we mean by teleology and especially its relationship with history. We should note that that JP has this all written down and we'll put the link to his yes. written piece in our notes. Yeah. And at least on my channel, I've also got a playlist with all of these conversations together so that if someone wants to sort of see them, they can see the development of them. So sorry, JP, go ahead. Thanks. Perfect. And it's worth saying that some of the things that I'll say about teleology are, they're meant to clear sort of the space because um, I, I took some time to look into the history and it's tied up with nominalism. The fact that um, the Christian vision of teleology became often warped is tied up with nominalism and now it rejected patterns in general, except for their imposition by minds, be they human minds or the divine mind. So I think you can trace in the classical tradition, for example, in, in, in Aquinas, you could put that in Augustine uh, as well, where you can speak of a kind of vertical teleology between, you can say, potentiality and intelligibility. Uh, like there's a drive for materiality, there's a drive for, for potential to be informed by patterns, and there's a drive for patterns to come and down incarnate into uh, potential. It ties up with the, the, the terms that we used last time, but this is a kind of teleology that you can see sort of vertically that even happens like outside of time. The, the intermission of emergence and emanation that happens at the highest scale is 
outside of time, like it's something vertical. There's no real narrative there. If you just sort of leave it at this spot. Um, and in the classical tradition, there's like, there's a great ontology of this going down like from the lowest scales of the emergence and emanation meeting like at the, at the mineral level back in their day. Now we would say, let's see the, the fundamental particle uh, of physics, for instance. And like this meeting of emergence and emanation keep stacking up at all of the layers of reality until you get like outside of space and time altogether in, in God who is like the, the, the origin and meeting of emergence and emanation altogether. Uh, and from this, you can start to think about what would, vert what would horizontal tele teleology be? It would be like an unfolding of like a, a directedness in things that happens through time. So the same way that we can say that matter is directed through pa to patterns and patterns are directed to matter, there's like in time, you'll see that for instance, uh, you can take classical examples like a match can be directed to fire if you do such and such things about it. Uh, you, you can see different intrinsic teleology in things. And something that Aristotle fleshed out well, for instance, back in his day. And um, when you, you can see this in this tree, when Aristotle took more place in the West, you can see the same thing happening in Muslim philosophers, by the way, where like this intrinsic teleology in things was also associated with a theology coming from the, the ground of intelligibility like itself. So in the same way that if the pattern of the match will include some teleology in the match, that the match will be directed towards certain things, there's also a teleology going down from the ground of intelligibility intelligibility itself in the way that it constrains the emergence of things within nature. And so you get to associate, okay, there's intrinsic teleology in things, but this can be linked up in a hierarchy that goes up to the ground of intelligibility itself. Um, but what has happened, it, it, it's not exactly like clear what all of the figures were and how this happened, but from what, what I see, and um, it's, um, I'm, I'm sort of basing myself on um, a work of an American philosopher called David Pasnow, I think from the University of Colorado. And he sort of makes the case that at least you can see very clearly in nominalists that what they will do is deny that there's any kind of teleology in intrinsic in things. They will say that the only real places where we can talk of teleology is in human actions or in divine actions. Uh, so rather than having the big hierarchy where there's intrinsic teleology in things, there's teleology in in, in humans when we decide to do things and also a kind of teleology that is outside of time and space altogether in the ground of being. Uh, now with nominalism, all that you have is human teleology and divine teleology. And at that point, things start to get weird because you deny sort of intrinsic intelligibility of the world, you deny intrinsic theology in the world. So things start to, to, to split apart. But why I like to go back to this framework is that it allows me to speak of a fundamental union of possibility and intelligibility. That mm -hmm. It's the fundamental way that the world works. It's emergence towards where emanation comes from. It's like a perfect intermeshing of, of those two. And what I try to flesh out in the article is that when there's a break in that meeting of emergence and emanation, you have, it, it's what evil is. Like it, it's the, the classic conception of evil, I think, where it's an absence of, of goodness, it's an absence of uh, a meeting of emergence and emanation somewhere. So what I tried to say then is to take what Nishitani does mm -hmm. to explain how to defeat evil, let's say locally through enlightenment. And I tried to make the claim that what Christ does is the sort of same thing, but at the highest scale. Uh, and that this really only works because of Easter. Like if, if I didn't take Easter seriously. I don't think that my, my claim would work uh, at the moment, but to try and use Nishitani, fusing it with the metaphysics that I just discussed, I think what happens is, let's see, you can see that we, we fall into all kinds of self-deceptive, self-destructive patterns that break the union of being in intelligibility. Uh, so we, I can confuse all kinds of things and do all kinds of bad things, break patterns in the world, rupture the meeting of emergence and nation. And what Nishitani, explains well, I think, in this book, is that if you try to sort of go down to the depths of that, if you try to see how we are fun fundamentally made of all kinds of 
fundamentally made. I should say I shouldn't I shouldn't put it th this drastically. Let's say we 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 fall prey to so many of those bad patterns. We are made up of so many things that turn out to be illusory because they're, they're negations of being in, in intelligibility somehow. That you you can keep doubting sort of layers and layers of yourself until you get down to the very bottom layer. But Nishidani doesn't want to stay there, like stop into nihility. So what he'll do is then he makes a move that I think is consonant with the classical tradition. He says that once you get to the ground, what you see is uh, like is that you can go beyond it. Like you don't have to, to stay there. Uh, you'll see, how does he call it? I, I have the article right there. So I'm going to try to get the exact uh, formula that he called it. Um, it's the, the turnabout from the great death to, to the great life. The, the place where you doubt doubt itself, the place where you sort of let all of the, the, the negative patterns defeat themselves. And then what, what you realize once you get there is as this happened, you're fundamentally made of emergence from this nothingness, of emergence from this potential. And you, through, through doing this and like, I'm obviously saying this propositionally at the moment because I have to, but like this is a real religious experience for, for Nishitani that is like, this has to be accompanied by all kinds of practice and you have to realize this in yourself. But through this, through like negating all of the bad patterns in yourself and communing with the ground of it all, you come to sort of reconstruct yourself with good patterns and like you can reach enlightenment where the logos is able to speak through, through you in a way that is at least a local victory over, uh, over evil over like the, the break between possibility and intelligibility. And then what I, what I try to, to claim then is that what the Christian narrative does is the same thing, but at a cosmic scale. Like, it's not an individual and psychological victory, let's say, as Siddhartha did, which is already a great thing. Like, I don't want to deny it. And I want, I, I'm even happy with saying that, uh, let's say, so the, 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 the self-sacrifice of Socrates for the Logos or the enlightenment of Siddhartha like participated in, in the incarnation. I just want to say that Christ brought this to a, a higher pitch uh, where he, he took all of the, like he sort of, in, in a way, he took all of the breakings, all of the, all of the possible ways to break the union of being in the intelligibility and he took it all upon himself. Like he was subject to like all the negative patterns you can imagine, like he was, uh, he was betrayed by people. He was crucified. He, he, all, of, all of the rendings of, being, of possibility and intelligibility, I think you can see them in the story of Christ. But then in the same way that Siddhartha is able to go beyond after reaching the depths of this, like Christ does it, does it, but at the cosmic scale through Easter. And like this ends up being a, a global victory over sin and death. Um, so it's, it's the basic idea. I could keep going into more details. Maybe it's worth at least speaking a bit about uh, primary and secondary uh, causality here. Um, so the kind of uh, teleology that we get when we speak about this is, it's not as straightforward as we, 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 we tend to think. Let's talk about some, some of the, the layers here. Um, it's possible for a higher form to act through lower forms in a way that doesn't negate the, let's say the, the genuine chance or freedom of the lower levels. So I give a few examples in, in the article, but let's say that I'm writing something on a board with, with chalk. Um, I'm using the chalk as a secondary cause here. Like I, I'm, I'm the, I'm not the, the primary cause really is God, but let's say in this example, like I'm the primary cause of, I decide what to write. Uh, but I do it through the chalk, and the, the, the chalk is a secondary cause. I don't deny the reality that the chalk is writing on the board. It's just that it's part of my higher pattern where I write on, on the chalk. But this can happen at higher levels of reality as well. An example I give is, a, is that of a parent. So a parent can freely make their child do their own work, for instance. If you know that your child enjoys playing, let's say, hockey and eating cookies, like you can tell your child to do their homework, and then they'll get that or that thing. And the child can freely decide to do their own work then. So a, a higher cause can act through a secondary cause without negating, let's say, contingency at the lower levels. 
And Aquinas is, is very clear about this, that God can cause things to happen necessarily or contingently. And that properly speaking, like those categories just don't apply to, to God himself of necessary or contingent actions. Um, but what this allows me to do is to say that what we see exemplified in the story of the incarnation, the crucifixion and the resurrection is that all things are ultimately brought to intelligibility. All things, that's the emergence of everything that happens within nature is, is constrained so that you have an emergence towards greater and greater levels of intelligibility. But that doesn't mean that there's a kind of determinism at the lower levels. And like there can genuinely be all kinds of evils and terrible things that happen at the lower levels. Uh, but it doesn't prevent the primary cause of all of it from bringing all things towards uh, himself. So I think it's a summary of what the article is. Um, it's already been a while that I've been saying this, so I don't know that I should keep going. You probably already have some responses. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe I can help, because I think someone just jumping into this video might, if, if, if you read JP's article, I thought your article was amazingly clear and lucid. And even though it is in, in many ways quite abstract and a little bit esoteric, um, I don't think it's it's too inaccessible for readers. Mm. You know, we we come to this. You know, part of you know part of the crux, let's say, between um, in in the conversations that that myself and Jonathan Bajot and JP have been having with you, John, ha has been this this question of to to what degree can we trade on? Um, let's let's call them the narrative faculties of Christianity and other religious narratives, usually ancient religious narratives, to, to, to rely on certain kinds of knowledge about the world. Because these religious stories are, these religious stories very much leverage narrative, uh, uh, moral valence, good versus evil, um, understanding teleology in terms of all of this stuff in the world is heading somewhere it is for something and mm -hmm. and then you know you very much brought in and we, we we talked about miracles and a bunch of other things but then you know you very much brought in well is that and, and i think in the middle of the 20th century even though it was a it was a like probably every other century in recorded history, it was a century soaked in blood. But for some reason, with the development of, of philosophy and religion in the West, the middle part of the 20th century, the, um, you know, the, the industrialized killing by the Nazis, and then we should throw on there the industrialized killing of you know, there were a number of genocides in, yes, the, yes, in the 20th yes. century, of which the Nazi genocide is obviously a, a horrific one. But, you know, Maoist China, Stalinist Soviet Union, um, the Armenian genocide. I mean, there's so many, so much bloodletting in the 20th century that many people came to the point of saying, hmm, could, is, is all of this suffering in some way can this be squared with the idea and the assumption that the story of humanity is finally a good story? And, or do we, I, I, I had a conversation with a, with a young man not too long ago, um, uh, Nate, who's been just back and forth over the line of Christianity a number of times. And, and I, I kind of summed it up to him this way. I said, is being fundamentally and finally evil, neutral, or good. And I think if you read JP's piece, you know, not only the incarnation, but I think in Christianity, the, the incarnation comes to its culmination in the resurrection. And, and that's sort of where we get into this, the miracle element of this. And in C.S. Lewis's book, Miracles, which sort of launched a lot of this, 
Um, mm -hmm. His article is his central chapter, which is the grand miracle, very much has both the incarnation and the resurrection, because it's in the resurrection where not only does Christ take on flesh, and I usually phrase it as creation 1.0, in the resurrection, he now creates in his resurrection the, the seed, the kernel of creation 2.0, which, and I think you nicely did it in your, in your piece, JP, creation 2.0, which then takes all of this suffering and all of this seeming waste, um, pointlessness that, that, that sort of, um, that, that, that sort of makes us say at the universe being is at best neutral. It doesn't seem to care about us. Um, or about efficiency, or about telos, or about any of this. But but in the in the resurrection, then all of this comes together. And I think you said quite nicely in the piece, JP, that you know the resurrection then is finishes the argument. I'd say about the goodness of being, and um, and but that that of course then for for many. For whom, especially in the modern period, look at something like the claim that Jesus of Nazareth uh, walked out of a grave after being dead, not just mortally wounded, but dead for a day and a half. On the third day, walks out of that tomb, shows up to disciples, and then ascends up to heaven. I mean, it, it's a let's let's Christians should be very honest about this. It's a big claim. <laughs> and, you know, my Jewish friends say the ascension disproves the resurrection because it'd be a lot better if he was hanging around and we could still kind of poke him in the hands and the side. But and so I don't know if that kind of helps some of our audience, um, mm -hmm. because listening to JP right now, we got we got Buddha and Nishitani and and, and teleology and causality. But if you read the piece, you'll I think you'll and if you read the piece and then listen to JP again, which you can do because of this lovely thing we have called video, I think you'll see how how it frames together. And this is a response to John's question, which is John is by no means alone. And I don't I don't take this as in any way an unreasonable question to, to look at what we know of the universe and what we continue to know about the universe as if even if one of us that Christians say are fallen, even a Calvinist, uh, you know, total, totally depraved human beings, we're not as bad as we could be, but we're affected by depravity. Even we could seem to maybe imagine a 20th century without Hitler, Stalin, and Mao. So that, that just kind of set that up. I, first of all, I think what Paul just did was great. Um, and I, I, I emphasize his recommendation not to take anything away from JP's presentation. Uh, but I think reading the article and then go and seeing what I think and seeing what JP said, it would be to, uh, to do do justice to his argument. I do like the fact that he has put, you know, enlightenment and Nishitani and intelligibility and emergence and emanation onto the table so that we can use them. And we have discussed those already before. Uh, so that's also not completely de novo if you look at previous videos. So I recommend also looking at the previous videos if there's some of these terms. You're coming in at, some of you, at, in a third. And, and, and the third book in a trilogy is always the most perplexing, right? Um, so um, I think what Paul did was also really good. Uh, and so let me first make sure I'm understanding. Um, I, wanted, I want this to be very much dialogos because I love you, you too, and I want to be like in good relationship throughout this. What I heard Paul saying is this comes down to a fundamental question uh, about whether or not uh, being is good. And, and then, uh, and I think that's really relevant uh, and related, JP, to the whole question about intelligibility and realness. So that's one thing. And then there, there, there was an implication there, or maybe a presupposition, that there's a connection between the goodness of being and there being some teleology that is disclosed by a narrative. There, is, that, is that okay so far? And that, uh, I don't know quite what the right adjective is, so don't jump on me, but, but a pivotal narrative 
is the narrative of the incarnation and the resurrection. And what that what it does is it is not supposed to be, I don't know what to say. Let me, let me instead of saying what it's not, let me try and say what it is, because I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. The point of the resurrection is it is, I don't want to say proof because that's not the right word. It's the final demonstration of the goodness of being within a narrative format. Is that fair so far? Have I, have I understood that uh, correctly? I think so. I don't know, JP, what do you think? Yeah, that, sound, that sounds good. Yeah. Okay, good. Because first of all, uh, that was excellent. Secondly, uh, uh, I, I want to also uh, reinforce Paul. Like JP, the work that you and Jonathan are doing, I keep saying this and people are, <laughs> right? It's really generous. It's really innovative. And in some profound ways, it's radical. So one thing in which you and I, or and I think maybe Paul, are radical is that, and I agree with you, I think that nominalism is a fundamental problem. And insofar as it, I would argue, maybe this is on your behalf, maybe it's not, you can let me know. I would argue that the degree to which nominalism has been, has insinuated it within the Christian framework, it actually fundamentally undermines Christianity in a profound kind of way. And so I see what you and uh, Jonathan are doing as really profound. Now, I happen to think um, that there are good arguments against nominalism, largely coming out from the revival of Platonism uh, in, in a big way. Uh, and at some point, I'd like to do why I think nominalism uh, should be rejected. What, one of the problems you have with nominalism, it comes, to its, it comes to its peak in Kant, right? We don't know anything out there. There's nothing out there. And all of the patterns are in here. And then you have to ask Kant, well, why does the mind have real patterns? And how do you know those? Do you have unmediated access to patterns in your mind? Well, why can't you have unmediated access to patterns, right? You get all these problems and then how do you, right? And how could you possibly do science and how can we understand the past if normal? And so I, I recommend Berman's book on this and another. So I won't go into it. I'm just giving some quick stabs of what well, I agree that we should reject nominalism. And I, I'm building towards, like I, I'm trying to give as much ground as I can, because if you reject nominalism, you have to take seriously the proposal that intelligibility is a feature of the world. And, and that is an radically important thing to say. And that's one of your presuppositions, JP, I think in your argument, okay? Yes, yes, I need that, yeah. Yes. And then you have, I, I mean, you, and, and then to bridge to Paul, you have an argument, and I keep recommending this book. Everybody should read Schindler's book, Plato's Critique of Impure Reason. It is the best book on Plato I have ever read in my whole career. Um, astonishing. Wow. <laughs> yes. That's a recommendation. Oh. And, and you'll be both pleased be, you'll both be pleased to know that he's a Christian. Uh, so um, uh, um. now the, I, I, I'm not going to try and recapitulate the whole argument, but this is the, the so I'll try and do it gesturally. Intelligibility and realness are like this. This is, this is one of the fundamental ideas. And then what Jenner says is if you see that, that that's a fundamental kind of goodness. That's a goodness that's independent of how things might be helpful to us. And that's a bit of a distinction what I, I want to make. So let me give you an idea of what he means. The goodness of truth, right? And we, we take truth to be a good, right? in some sense has to be independent of how it could be good for us or, the tr or how much we like it or prefer it or the truth can't do its job as the truth. Just, I mean, that's not the complete argument, but I'm trying to give a gist to it, right? So there's this kind of fundamental ontological goodness. And, and of course, that's why Plato calls the ultimate thing, principle of reality and intelligibility and realness, the good. Now, this is not an ethical good. It's not an aesthetic good. It's a fundamental ontological good. Is that, is that okay so far? Okay, so, so far, we're all playing uh, uh, the same game, uh, and that's good. Um, so here's the issue that I have, right, which is, again, and I, by the way, I would think that there's analogous arguments in Buddhism about nirvana and shunyata being good in that they ultimately afford, it ultimately affords the liberation of all beings. And this isn't a moral goodness, it's a, it's a fundamental ontological goodness. Okay, so here's the thing. 
I would want to say, does that notion of goodness depend on anything like Aristotelian final causality? Does it depend on things working towards some final state of completion? Because what I would propose is that's not the case, that there's no intrinsic connection between intelligible, intelligibility, realness, goodness, and any kind of proposal of a progression in either human history or cosmological history, right? So that's the question. And then can you to, can you say it one more time? I'm typing it as as you go. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm proposing is uh, basically uh, I've tried to get agreement that we, we're working in the same place. We're rejecting nominalism. We're taking intelligibility serious. It it, it really gives a profound Platonic Neoplatonic answer to Paul's question about a kind of fundamental goodness that's not a moral goodness, not an aesthetic goodness. And I tried to indicate what that might look like, like the goodness of why pursue the truth. It has to be good in some way. Right, things like that. I'm just trying to lay that out. And then my question is, given all of that, and I'm trying to give a lot of common ground, is there any entailment or necessary connection between that ontological goodness and there being any progression in human history or natural history? It seems to me there isn't any necessary entailment there. Right uh, now. The, re the reason why the Greeks were able to put it together and Augustine and Aquinas sit on this is Aristotle had a notion of final causation that was based on the idea that that goodness expressed itself even in inanimate things seeking out conditions of improvement. Now, if we if if that if that notion and there are other notions of teleology we might want to explore together here, but if that notion of teleology, the one introduced by Aristotle, assumed by Augustine and Aquinas, comes into question, then the claim that there's some intrinsic connection between the goodness of being and teleology comes into question as well. Is that okay so far? And here's how I would call it into question, which is, right, the two things. So what Paul already beautifully said it. In human history, we, we, we get, you know, we get Auschwitz, and we get the gulags and the genocides, we get the cultural revolution, we get the killing fields, we get the Armenian genocide, we get the genocide of the indigenous people in North America, like just horrific stuff, right? A lot of it done by the way, and this is not an irrelevant point, explicitly in the name of progress. It was justified and done, right? In the name of progress in some utopic vision. Now, so history is in question for that reason. The other thing that, I, I, that, that Paul didn't bring up is our view of the universe has expanded tremendously, right? We now know that in terms of material scope, causal power energy, we are absolute minutia, and, 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 and both in time and space and causation, both in time and space and also in causation. And so the idea that all of this vastness in time and space was somehow bound up to us seems implausible to me. And also, when you look at the, the, just most of this stuff, it seems not like, a, it doesn't seem like it's made for us. In fact, the opposite seems to be the case that life has struggled to adapt itself to an otherwise hostile universe. So I do not see evidence of a seeking function in history or natural history. Uh, sorry, in human history or natural history. Calling it natural history is a bit of a misnomer, but that's what we've ended up calling it. So I'll just go with that. So that's the, that, that's the issue for me. And so I can see, I can, I, 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 sorry, and I, I don't mean to be condescending. I can see Jesus is, Jesus, death and resurrection, we'll put aside if, if it's a miracle, because then we're just assuming something to, to show something, right? Whatever that is, and whatever it means, and whatever that story means, whether it's mythos, and you know I don't mean that pejoratively, or it was something that could be viewed and photos could be taken of it or something like that. And, and that doesn't even seem to be the case, because it's, it's like the, the physicality of that is, even in the gospels, is very weird. 
Um, so I could even acknowledge that that would be above and beyond enlightenment, maybe enlightenment 2.0, in that it is like, and JP gave me this, like the death of Socrates and like the Buddha's enlightenment, but there's something more about it disclosing the ultimate goodness of being. Um, and, 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 there, and the reason why I'm willing to give that is because that theme runs throughout Christ's teaching in a profound, profound way. And so, and it's not as present in uh, the Socratic tradition or the, uh, or the Buddhist tradition, although Plato does have the idea of the ontological good, right? But, so I'm willing to say that that, whatever it is, right? And I'm trying to be neutral on it and not, not disparage it, right? I'm willing to say, yes, I can see how that could disclose in a profound way and maybe, you know, historically even unique way, this fundamental goodness of being. And maybe that's one of the reasons why Christianity and Platonism found each other. That would be a very plausible historical explanation. But for all of that, I don't see it generalizing for the reasons I've given to the redemption of history and the redemption of the universe. So I've tried to be as forthcoming as I could and responsive as I, as I could. I can try responding unless you want to go ahead first, Paul. No, I, I want to hear what you have to say. I've got plenty yeah. of ideas, but I want to hear you. <laughs> yeah, sort of twofold. So about what kind of teleology I want exactly. Um, I don't need something. I don't think I need something as, I don't, I hesitate to use the word deterministic, but I don't want to, I don't, I don't want something as directed or deterministic as Aristotle. I don't think I, I need that. Um, and it's why I was trying to appeal to the sort of distinction between horizontal, uh, horizontal and vertical teleology earlier. So I think that, let's see, all things, so, I mean, in eternity, like outside of time, if you look at things at the highest of scales, like things are always, are always drawn up towards intelligibility, towards truth. That's like things exist only in as much as they participate in, in intelligibility. So I think that always happens like at in, any instant, uh, sorry, in eternity. But in time, I don't, I don't need, I think, this unfoldment to be, let's say, as straightforward as Aristotle was, uh, was saying, let's say. Um, I'm, that's why in the article, and I, I'm, I'm trying to, to walk a very thin line here, um, mm -hmm. because I don't want to say that the, the incarnation happened sort of just by accident. And I don't want to say either that it was deterministic, that like things just had to fit this way exactly, and there was no place for contingency uh, in there. I want to say that the, let's see the, the, the seed uh, that we see in the incarnation and resurrection realized the Christian narrative because, okay, and this is tied up to my second part of, to the second part of my, my response. Uh, so first I, I want to say, I, it, I don't think it had to happen this way. Like I, I think the, the same fulfillment of the same drawing up of all of creation towards one point, towards eternity, the same affirmation of the, the, the fundamental goodness of creation could have been established some other way. Um, but I think that the way it happened now is, is coherent. And I think it's what allows me to like, at least give an answer. I'm not a saint, so I can't like give like a full answer, especially propositionally to the, like this, the, the history part of it. But what I see in, in the seed of Christ's own incarnation, I think explains the pattern that has been unfolding uh, since then, because we see the wheat and the tares grow up together. Like the, I, the, let's say Christ's assertion of the fundamental goodness of creation is tied up with the incarnation also being in a way the worst event in all of creation, where all of creation, let's say all of the worst things that could happen to the logos happen to the logos in the, in, in the incarnation. But I have to non-logically identify this with also the greatest events in creation, like the, the, the greatest praise towards intelligibility. Um, and I think it's in, in seeing how that seed grows in history 
that I can at least make sense, make some sense, uh, at least for me. And I, 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 I won't keep repeating that I'm not a scientist, so I can't fully explain this. But like the glimpses I get is that there are there are saints who follow in that same pattern where Christ revealed the fundamental goodness of creation. You can sit in the apostles who followed Christ after after the apostles themselves participated in the persecution of Christ, except for for, for John. But like the other apostles denied him or, or like abandoned them somehow. After afterwards, they were brought up into that pattern, into that seed, and they themselves were martyred and like became images of the same thing. And then it kept growing, creating the church, cre creating churches. And then the churches themselves were persecuted in the martyrs. And that this grew like this. It keeps growing through these deaths and resurrection. And it's, it's, it's the wheat in the tares. I'm not able to like separate them at least personally. And Christ encouraged us to not try to separate them really. Uh, but like, it seems that like the fundamental assertion of the good goes through sort of capturing all of the bad around itself. So, I mean, Christ did a bunch of things to provoke in a way the, like to, to bring all of the bad towards him, like to bring all the persecution that he injured. Like he did this, he, he brought out the worst in many people by being there. And then it's what allowed him to reassert goodness. But I think this has been unfolding throughout history. So in like the, it's like the, the best and the worst keep growing together. So the 20th century was the worst in many ways with like all the atrocities that you mentioned. But you also saw a bunch of saints. Like I have a book here of like a um, father, Girion, Girion Goldman. Like he was a German Franciscan seminarian who like got rolled up into the SS because he was German. And like he refused in all kinds of ways to, to participate. And like faced death like on multiple occasions, as you can imagine, kept getting into trouble. But like he, you, you also have there the story of a saint who is like the wheat among the tares there, who did all kinds of amazing things in that story. You have John Paul II, who also like faced persecution from the, the, the Nazis and the communists. You, you, there's like the same pattern, the way that the union of being and intelligibility were reasserted in Christ through this weird capture of bad unto itself like keeps spreading and that's how i can make sense of history but i need easter for that to be like a real victory so um like the i don't know how much it can be viable to people who let's say don't find easter viable but i think that if i get it then i can make sense of like this this messy unfolding that we see in history so i'm I, I want to be responsive and respectful of the fact that you're trying to draw stuff out and you're on the edge. We all are on the edge of, of intelligibility. And so um, I, I don't want to like, want to, I don't want to take it. Uh, I don't want to take advantage of that in any kind of in a, inappropriate way. I, so, I trust you, John. I trust you. Okay, great. Uh, well, I do. I trust both of you too. So um, as long as that's clear, because so I, I, I again, I see, I, I'm willing to say with you, and, and you extended it beyond the Christian history. You did it with the Buddha. And I'm willing to say that there, let's use that term. John Hicks used it in his book on the interpretation of religion. There are saints and a saint is something more than a sage. A saint does this thing of like disclosing in their life, the goodness of, of being. And so totally. And I, I, think, I think bringing that up as Paul and you have done right now as like, we need to, we need an account of how this is possible. Um, I think that, I, I think that's important, first of all. So whether or not we, we, we come to some final agreement, just getting that out there is an, I mean, the, I, I mean, it, it's like, we need an account of reality that properly accounts for this phenomena where we encounter lives that seem to, like the beauty of a sunrise, these lives shock us into the declaration of sort of the inherent goodness of being. Again, I want to emphasize this is not aesthetic or moral uh, goodness. This is ontological goodness, which is 
There's, there's something about we value realness for its own sake, even if we suffer tremendously to undergo a relationship to that realness. That's what I'm putting my finger on, right? So I acknowledge all of that, and I think it's important. Um, so, so that's a common point. Now, the, the point that the, the second, what I hear you, and if I'm misunderstanding you, I, I hear you wanted to say, but beyond that, John, there is evidence of, let's call it the redemptive wave spreading out, right? You, you were talking about how this spreads out through history. And, and, and this is the evidence for kind of a redemptive, like I call it the redemptive wave, a redemptive wave per, like that spreads out. And that's what's lifting things towards uh, um, some better state. And that's a kind of teleology in the universe. Is, is, am I getting that part of the argument right? Because that's yes. what I'm trying, I'm trying. Okay. So, so the, the, I guess the issue I have uh, with that, um, it, it, and I don't want to be unfair, but the church's history is really checkered and bad in a lot of ways. Right? And, and uh, like, and so. And you don't and, even work in one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and by the way, and towards your point about the weed and the tares, there, there, and I've, I've already acknowledged the church has also produced mystics and sages and saints. And, and so I don't want, I don't want to do the, 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 the you know, the skeptard kind of thing where you, you know, you compare the worst of religion to the best of secularity or anything ridiculous like that. I'm not, not doing that. I'm not doing that. I'm just responding to this specific new argument about the spread, the, the spread of the redemptive wave. And yet when I look at the history of the church, it's, it's a really checkered history. And the church has even been at war itself, like in some of the bloodiest wars in history, where the, where the wars of the 17th century between the Protestants and the Catholics. It's wonderful that Catholics and Protestants can sit here together now and, and, and be in fellowship and love each other. That wasn't always the case, right? Um, and so the, the, the problem I have with the, that's one side, the spread seems to be checkered. And on the other side, I see other things spreading in that way too. Uh, Buddhism spreading that way, particularly, or Islam spreading that way. Um, and Islam, you know, while acknowledging Jesus as a prophet, doesn't have the same uh, redemptive incarnation uh, theology that you two have. Um, so, I, again, that's the part where the, the, the human history really uh, bedevils me. Uh, sorry for that. That was perhaps a bad pun. I didn't mean it. <laughs> uh, but, I think uh, it's a good word. <laughs> <laughs> but, but again, the, so first point is the checkered history. Second, other things spread. Third, I have a hard time seeing that spreading into natural history at all. Uh, I do, uh, th that's where the spreading argument I find very difficult, like in what way, right? Uh, like is, is that spreading so that the, the, the natural world becomes more and more apparently better than it was uh, before. And so the fourth point is, what would be the evidence that you're wrong? Right? Like if we set it so that no matter what it counts as this, then that's not, that's nothing, right? You're not making an argument anymore. You're just defining a thing. So the four points I make is the, the spread in history, the church is checkered. Other things have spread, right? I don't see how it spreads to natural history. And um, like, I, I, in fact, going back to the checkered thing, Remember my point that a lot of these genocides were driven by claims of progress and betterment. So I can strengthen my first argument. And then the fourth argument, would, the fourth point is, well, what would, it, what would be the evidence that your proposal is wrong? What would it look like if what I was saying was the case, that there is, a, there is an ontological goodness and there are lives of enlightenment that exemplify and shine that. And so we get, we get kind of non-propositional proof of the goodness of being. And Plato is, Plato is in line with this because the, mo the most important demonstration 
of the goodness of being is Socrates' death. Only Socrates' death gives final confidence to his claim that the unexamined life is not worth living. So I, I'm willing to say all of that, which is a lot, I think, right? And, then, and that's consistent, nevertheless, with all of the atrocities and all of this checkered history and the fact that the natural universe seems basically, you know, <laughs> inhospitable to us. So I hope I'm being fair. Oh, no, yeah. I, I think you're very fair. Um, I, I could be a lot more brutal. <laughs> So I, you're, you're always, you're always very generous. Let, let me, one of the things that, but one of the things that I often come around to in many of these arguments is the strangeness of the ontological argument. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one, one of the things I was thinking about with, um, especially with your, your description here, um, I, I just, I'll just, you know, I, I, I'm a pretty fast typist. You know, our view of the universe has expanded tremendously in terms of the material scope. We are minutia in time and space and causation. All of this vastness is somehow bound up to us. Um, bound up to us seems it seems implausible. It doesn't seem like it's it's made for us. Um, I do not see an evidence of seeking function in human history or natural history. I really like that a seeking function. I, what I think about, and and I think I think. It's important here to recognize that, and even as a Christian, I'm, I'm preaching. You know, I'm preaching through Paul now, um, and 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 with the with Paul of Tarsus. I mean, faith when he's when he's wrestling with the question of circumcision um, and inclusion in the people of God uh, by faith apart from the works of the law. There's a there's there's within Christianity always, at least within the Christian narrative, on this side of, of the, the presence, the parousia, which, you know, I've been listening to some interesting philosophy lately and understanding a little bit broader how broad that Greek word is and, and what it meant in some other areas. But, mm -hmm. but before, be, before the coming of the presence, and, and that's very much how it is in Christian theology, that um, the return of Christ is seen as the coming of the presence. It's it's the, you know, it's the culmination that un until that day, the best the best that we can have is is leaning into the future in faith. And I even think of you know some of Jordan's language, um, living living as if this story is true right now. And that I think there's a. I think there's a degree of faith built into that that idea. One of the things that I think about in terms of in terms of scope and broadness is is the relationship between smallness and I'll say peakness. Um, mm -hmm. We spend point. most of our time doing mundane things. How many hours do we spend sleeping or eating or you know, bathing or, you know, doing labor to somehow put food on the table. And, and you think about someone and, and they might come to a point where, it, and where they say, my whole life is about this. And, mm -hmm. and, and even for us human beings, especially those of us who work with our minds and work with our mouths, anybody watching who perhaps didn't understand the language would look at us and say, you, you, your your whole life is about an idea. I mean, you, you don't see that from space. Yet, one of one of the things that I, you know, one of the things that I, and that that, and we simply accept that in our in our lives that we can live 60, 70, 80 years, and you know, E equals M C squared, which is you know, a line this long somehow gives value to a man's life, and in fact, an entire entire flow of history which is, is which is simply thought thought and scribbled on lang, you know scribbled on paper um you know we're we're very strange that way in terms of our valuations of things that 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 almost the very small and imperceptible can as our language says means the world to us and so i i i think about that and and i also think about you know, the strangeness of life and that it is, 
like, like you say, John, we just even look in our solar system and, you know, C.S. Lewis wrote um, space fantasies of creatures on Venus and Mars, and we send our little probes up there and, you know, well, there's dirt, maybe, maybe there's a little bit of ice left, um, but seems kind of pointless. And, you know, we certainly seem fragile in the way that we're, um, you know, living in fires and floods and hurricanes and whatnot today. Yet, one of the one of the the strange things, and I really appreciate JP's mention of the wheat and the tares. You know, one one of the strange things seems to be that yes, the twentieth century was awful, but we recognize it as awful, and we care that it's awful. And if you read much history, you know, before, you know, before Christ, I mean, genocide, the, the, the Neanderthals didn't, you know, didn't do a Jonestown. Um, you know, we probably wiped them out and replaced them. And, you know, that's evidence in the, in the, in the genetic. And, you know, I, I sometimes look at, you know, the conversations around the, the genocide perpetrated by European colonials in North America. Well, there was probably 14,500 years of constant genocide going on in the Americas before the Europeans got involved. Yes, yes And yes. they brought that over from Asia because this is, this is what we do. And it's a startling thing that we're now troubled by this. Because even if you read um, you know, I, over my vacation, I was reading Tom Holland's Dynasty, and you know, one of the one of the interesting things about Tom Holland's personal journey was, you know, he used to revel in the classics and enjoyed it, and at some point he began to read it, and the more, you know, primary source material he read, the more horrified was not just that this is what we do to each other, but we just didn't care, and and the question of, you know, justification. And, and I'm not I'm not about to you know try to exonerate Christians in this in this march or say that it's it's necessarily you know uniquely Christian that we have scruples about the suffering because that's not true, but um, it's a it, it's a strange strange thing that 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 we somehow care about. And, and we somehow even project onto people, often with gross exaggeration and getting all kinds of things wrong. We project upon total strangers a suffering that troubles us so deeply that we will go out of our way to, to sacrifice on their behalf. Mm -hmm. A strange thing we're doing. And, and yet, you know, I, I look at Tom Holland's work and, and it, it seems hard to deny that a good deal of this happened because not only did this did this strange man walk around getting most of the people who listened to him either excited and eventually pretty angry enough to kill him, but he he sort of inspired a lot of people to 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 give to give their lives in such a irresponsibly sacrificial way that the classical world just sort of stopped and you know people often always try to say well you know it was those it was those tyrannical powerful church fathers who somehow you know used roman power to wipe out paganism most of the evidence is that paganism sort of died with a whimper in some ways sort of like many christians are, are many churches are today especially in quebec so there's you know i i don't you know i can't really answer and and i don't think in christian narrative we can really answer the question short of the parousia the 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 coming and i think that gets to your gets to your point john that um what would it look like if what, what would it look like if, let's say, I, as a Christian minister, am completely wrong about all of this? Mm -hmm. And I think it sort of looks like what I think the predominant scientific models say, which is that 
we've got this flurry right now of, of, of small little creatures wanting to ensure their own existence until something big enough finally takes us out and none of it means anything at least in that teleological framework and you know then maybe you can blame christianity for the meaning crisis because maybe we wouldn't have had our crisis of meaning if we hadn't got our hopes up <laughs> so i i you know those are the those are the kinds of things that because you know i think you you laid it out quite well john and you know, the, these things aren't alien to me. And, and it's not like I, I, I go to bed every night thinking I need better proof so I can convince everyone I'm right. It, it's yeah. much more, I, I look out in space and it's like, yeah, life is fragile. Yeah. We seem to be cooking the planet. Yeah. We're, we're awful, awfully horrible to each other. And it's fairly easy to point to history with Christians behaving badly, but I've got evidence back here in this room i see it happen regularly and even more i got evidence in my own skin so um you know it's it's for that reason that 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 i i completely understand the the challenge yet where i where i always sort of land is is this pivot on an ontological argument that perhaps um you know, if I can imagine a better world, perhaps not only do I have hope for that better world, but I might have at least enough evidence to justify that I'm not irresponsible or reckless with my truth. And, and that's, that's kind of where I land. Well, first of all, that's... Uh... It's a very authentic and well-articulated response. Um, I don't know if I answered any of the philosophy, but <laughs> well, but 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 part of your point is this is not and and should not be just a philosophical argument. We're we're back to what JP said. We're struggling with propositional language to talk about things that ultimately are not processed. I'll try to use a neutral word, propositionally. Um, and, and and I of course <laughs> deeply acknowledge that. So. Um, um, I want to I want to state that. I think, I mean, one of the arguments against nominalism, um, uh, in addition to the ones I gave, was an argument you gave, um, which is, um, and this is a Platonic argument, which is, right, that, that we need we we have to account for our ability, uh, like you like you said, to come into these normative judgments. And remember, and, and you know the 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 sort of secular. Rationalists, oh, blah, blah, blah. no, you need to also account for your judgments about truth. Uh, and, and that's also a normative term. You can't put truth over here as an unjustified normative term that somehow you don't try and fit into your ontology and that's okay. And then, you know, you know, besmirch uh, beauty and moral goodness over here. That it, that's an incoherent point. And that's Plato's point again and again and again. So I acknowledge that. Um, and, and, I, and, and, I, and like I said, I, I also acknowledge, I think, I should talk to Tom Holland someday. I also acknowledge, and I try, and I, and I, I, I hope, um, I hope you see this. I was trying to acknowledge that there are historical events, independent of sort of logical argument, uh, in these lives that have an impact that the arguments alone can't have. I acknowledge that. I think that's, uh, and and so I think that's important. And uh, you know, um, I, I, I. I like I, I want to say that there are these lives that, um, like that uh, that that are 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 the wave crest of 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 humanity, and they remind us that the water can rise and not only and not only sink or some tortured metaphor around that. Uh, um, and, and so, and, and 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 I want to acknowledge all of that. I guess what I want you, I'm going to, what I'm now going to ask is. To acknowledge something, sort of how I find help. Um, if there's no teleology, in a deep sense, then the fact that my actions are irrelevant to something one million years in the future means, by perfect symmetry of argument, what happens one million years from now is irrelevant to the meaning of my life now. 
Like this is the Nishitani. If you follow the absurdity down, it can actually do this aspect shift where you realize, wait, the largeness of things actually undermines itself as a way of trying to undermine the value of my small little life. And I get there precisely because I, there isn't a teleology. Because if there's a teleology, then what I do now has to matter. And then it seems like it can't possibly matter. And that's how you get the sort of some of the classical arguments for absurdity and meaninglessness. Whereas if you were, so not only like does the teleology, the teleological vision breed utopias and utopias breed genocides. I think that's a very direct argument. There's another argument I make over here and I've done larger versions elsewhere, which is yes, yes. But if there's something, it, it, I hope you don't find this insulting but there's something redemptive, right? And I, and I see Camus trying to do this in giving up teleology because there's a way in which it protects lives from the, the, the Lovecraftian hugeness of things that would horrify us into meaninglessness. And, and for me, that, that, that is a profoundly helpful vision. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to compete with visions, but I, I, I'm trying to say, but there, there's also something that can also give you, you know, uh, a soothing, you know, at 3 a.m. when you wake up, right? It's like, well, maybe that's not the way meaning works because if meaning isn't bound to teleology, then the absurdity undermines itself and then human lives are now protected from that kind of Lovecraftian threat. I don't know if that makes any sense, but I'm trying to say, right, that they're, they're, I have in many places acknowledged that when we lost the teleological vision, that was horrible. And so I'm not, I'm not trying to dismiss, but I'm trying to say there's something about losing the teleological vision that's also um, good, fundamentally good, because it, 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 it removes us uh, from a kind of, like I said, a, a, a kind of being crushed uh, by our ability to imagine these scales of things and to try and bear the responsibility on our shoulders of these huge scales uh, of things. So I don't know what you think about that. I'd be interested in hearing both of your responses to that. I think that's a very good argument, John. I had never heard it put this way, and I think I think I think it's really it's a really good argument. Um, if you which we could say is if. It's if you don't have teleology, then like you can reach enlightenment with Siddhartha. And I, I, I think that's great. I think if you want teleology, uh, you probably need Easter or something like it to show that like this spreading can actually succeed in the face of all of the death that we see. And it's sort of how I would like to try to respond to your, I really like the challenge you asked to see what would falsify our position. Um, because I think it's, because, because I'm aware that there's a trap in the fact that the Christian tradition is so old and so rich that it's easy to find some symbolism somewhere to explain everything that's happening. Um, but I've, I've, and, and I think I heard you make this point in the Q&A a while back. So I had some time to think about it and like one way for the Christian narrative to be falsified, for let's say the, the open Easter to be falsified is like what Paul said. And I think another one is if enlightenment was spread more successfully some other way, like if uh, we saw, um, like if this progress happened like outside of Christianity in a way that surpassed what happens within Christianity, I think that this would also be a good counter argument. Like, that's, that's, that's a good point. I just want to acknowledge it. That's a good point. That's a good point. So keep going, please. That's a good point. Because let's see what Paul said earlier. I think you, you put Tom Holland's point excellently, where like the wheat and the tears grow together. Like the fact that we see there's all kinds of bad, terrible things happening, but our very perception of them as bad is a sign that there is something special going on. And like this, if I think about Peter, for instance, Peter did some of the most horrible, like, Peter's denial of Christ is the, the most horrible thing that Peter could do, but he could only do it because Christ first brought him towards him. So it's the idea that the, the corruption of the best is the worst. And 
I can see that this sort of trickle, I, I'm going back to my earlier argument, so I don't know if I, 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 I want to be careful not to go around in circles, but like the, the this wave spreading of elevating, taking something bad, elevate, elevating it, and then this good thing, because it's higher now, can also fragment into something worse. So I mean, the Christianity civilized Europe and like transformed, like it took barbarians in Europe and turned them into like a, a, a flourishing civilization towards the Middle Ages. But then like this, the fact that Western Europe was so organized, so so well-structured also gave rise to the terrible things that happened in the 20th century. The, the best was turned into the worst. And I'm the, the, the Christian optimism that goes beyond the denial of theology. And I, I agree, John, that I think your point is great. Like if, if I had come across this five, 10 years ago, my life could have been very different. But like now what, <laughs> what, what I see in, like now that let's say the, the Christian narrative is viable to me, I'm able to track that if I have the resurrection plus Easter, Plus, I'm able to see the seeds of Easter spreading throughout history. Um, I'm, I think I'm able to respond to, to, to the challenge of like seeing what's happening throughout history. But at the same time, I have to acknowledge that if we saw some other means of spreading enlightenment that was superior to Christianity, then it would be a falsification of what I'm saying. And like, but I, I have to stress just how much things can be bad within the, the Christian story. And I, what I said after, about Peter, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm saying as a Catholic who thinks that the Catholic church is Peter. Mm -hmm. I appreciate so, that. Yeah, so I, I, I think that the, this, the, the wheat and the tares keep growing together. And yeah, I think I'm just gonna keep repeating myself if I, if I, if I keep going. Uh, I, I hope that at least answers some of your, <laughs> your questions better than what I had said earlier. I, I think it's I think it's horrible if we sit and we contemplate when Jesus said it's the sick who need the doctor, and oh, you mean us? <laughs> That's why there's so many rotten people in the church. John, I have a I have a question about your and and I I don't want to. For, first of all, I want to say that your your point about releasing teleology. And the, 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 the point of meaningfulness in the release of tele teleology, I, I not only take seriously, but, but have experienced. Okay, let me, let me say that mm -hmm. first. Um, but part of the argument against that there is teleology in, in some ways, and maybe I'm totally wrong here, so feel free to swat it away. You know, isn't the horror we experience in viewing the suffering of others, that, that horror is, is energized by teleology, is it not? Because when we watch the, the lives of, of Viktor Frankl's family snuffed out, when we watch you know, millions of young people, even if they're not killed in some gulag or some re-education camp, their lives are, they're, they're somehow, they're somehow colonized and turned into, into killers. Um, the horror we face, um, the, our recognition of, of the evil has built within it, within it, um, teleological assumptions about well, the good life for that young person is, you know, reciprocal broadening. Yeah, yeah. And, and the good life for, you know, Viktor Frankl's family is, you know, ongoing development of a, not, of a beautiful young scientist and, a, you know, and, and, and this whole career that would be out in front of him. And, and that if, if, in a sense, you give up on teleology, you also, in a sense, lose the capacity to recognize the horrors of this world, because now suddenly it just all is. And, and whereas we can recognize the value of that when we, when we in ourselves try to unwind the, 
the thousands of years of, of narrative, you know, teleological patterns of thought, we also lose the, we also in a sense lose the, the prophetic spirit within us that sees the horrors of the 20th century and says, life was not meant to be this way. Human beings have a dignity uh, and, and there's almost teleology built into that dignity. And so my, my fear is in a sense of that we, if that we, by embracing a non-teleological -tele perspective, we lose, we certainly lose the suffering and we gain a sweet, but we also lose the capacity to resist the suffering because in, in a sense, we lose the capacity to recognize it. I don't know if that's fair, but I, it just was a thought that I had. Well, it's a good thought, and 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 we've circled back, but it's circumambulation, not just re 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 empty circling. Back to my original question, uh, which I posed from a platonic perspective, which is to posit ontological goodness that gives us genuine standards by which we can recognize truth, etc. And yet, that does not seem to entail that there is a teleology uh, 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 unfolding. Uh, in fact, uh, one possible response could be. Isn't, isn't this a better explanation of both things? There's ontological goodness. My sense that there is no teleology impels me to action precisely because if I don't do anything, the goodness is not going to come to expression. Um, and, and in fact, um, I, I increase my efforts because I, I, I'm not convinced that there's any force in the universe, like like, like the like the like the like like the, like the light side of the force or something, uh, drawing things forward. So, I mean, part of what my original question, and maybe you're challenging it, and so that that's a good place to. Uh, I was positing the possibility of ontological goodness that doesn't entail a teleological at for, uh, a teleological force, because I already said let's grant real intelligibility, and then let's grant the real connection, interpenetration between realness, goodness, and intelligibility, all of that. And, and, and you need that in order to make all the normative judgments, judgments about truth and goodness and beauty. And then when we make those judgments, they give us a sense of how things could be uh, and how things should be. That's not the same thing as a sense that there's th something driving towards them. In fact, um, one, uh, one way of saying is, no, it's precisely because I recognize that things could be this way or should be this way, and that there's nothing other than me here now and others that are going to bring that about. Um, uh, so I don't know, Paul, if this is responding to you, but what, I, what I'm getting, I hope, is I think we're coming to maybe the deep pivot point here. Is it possible, and I'm claiming it is, and maybe you're claiming you're not, and we're not just disagreeing, we're trying to work this out. I'm claiming it's possible to recognize that the, the, the goodness of being without thinking that that goodness is, right, is teleological in its nature, that it's driving history forward and driving the physical universe forward. In fact, it seems to have, and maybe this is what JP was trying to get at with secondary causation. It seems to have, right, it seems to only work <laughs> to be, uh, through people who are inspired by it. Um, like a, a, a way of putting this question, uh, it seems plausible to me that if there were no human beings, I wouldn't see this goodness at work in the world and I would still see all the horrible nature, red and tooth and claw and all the horrible suffering going on all around me and nothing in the natural world. And again, Lewis points to this, indicating anything that's trying to alleviate all that suffering that all of these organisms are doing for billions of years. And the only place where I see, you know, that p things alleviating that suffering, and it's in, 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 you're right, it's in the history of Christianity, it's people being inspired by the, the goodness of being in perhaps a way only human beings can be in order to try and make a difference. I'm sorry, I don't know if that's clear, but that's my, that's my attempt to respond. Yeah. I, I, uh, it, 
Go ahead, JP. I, I, was, I was expecting you to, I, I don't know if anything. I can, I can go. I mean, I, I yeah, actually was going to say, but you, you seemed like you had something, so you can go. Well, if you want, I've but... always got something. Yeah, that's, that's, why, but... that's why I make too many videos for John to watch. <laughs> <laughs> but... uh, my friends, I, I hope I'm not being obtuse or difficult, am I? I'm trying no, to. No, 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 not at all. No. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I, I guess, and, and I, I wrestle with if I'm being obtuse because I, I just find you know, and I love the way JP in his paper, you know, I, I could never do that, that essay, like we link below here, like JP did, where you have emergence and emanation and, and, you know, non being as potential. I mean, he just weaved all this stuff together. And I thought it was, I thought it was beautiful. Um, but, but the, it, it seems to me, well, let me ask this question then. Isn't, isn't potential by its nature, in some ways, teleological? The, so that's a very good question. And now part of what we've been doing in this discussion, and I think it's fair, is we've been playing with a pretty standard notion of teleology. There's work going on within my colleague at the University of Toronto, uh, Dennis Walsh. And yes, all of the important work being done in the world right now is being done at the University of Toronto. Um, <laughs> he, where he is trying to indicate that if we're going to do biology, we have to bring back a kind of teleological explanation where we talk about not causation, but we talk about how things conduce. So this set of factors conduces for this, uh, right? And, and, and in that sense, and this is a very good question, Paul. So I'm trying to respond to it very carefully. Um, there's a sense in which potentiality is, is, is if I, is, uh, as I think Dennis is arguing, and a lot of other people, uh, Eastman and his work on untangling the, the Gordian knot, sorry, it's storming here. Um, potential is real, and there, there, there is a, there, and this is, you know, uh, a, a platonic white handing idea. There's a real structure to possibility. Uh, things are structured so that, uh, you know, possibility doesn't unfold into actuality in a haphazard fashion. It, it patterns, reliably patterns, invariant patterns, intelligible patterns. Yes, all of that. Now, the thing about that, and, and here's where we have to be really careful, is the temptation to start talking about potentiality as if it's actuality, as if it's making things happen, because that would then be to give up the very point that all of this is based on, that potential is radically other than actual and, right, and should not be reduced to actuality. I mean, this is one of the sins, to my mind, of the Aristotelian framework. Aristotle tries to make potentiality completely dependent on actuality. It's one of the critiques that Nishitani brings against it, uh, because Nishitani says, if you can't get to that bottom unless you can realize the reality of the nihil. If you can't realize it, then you can't, you can't fathom it. And if you can't fathom it, you won't understand it. And if you don't understand it, there's no, there's no way of getting released from it. I think that's a very profound argument. Uh, so I'd be willing to say that, again, the relationship between actuality and potentiality is neither an actual nor a potential relationship. It is something deeper. It's like the one, or if you want, uh, if you allow me to use your language, like God, it, it's that, you know, Nicholas of Cusa definitely does that. I've been reading a lot of him uh, lately um, and that idea. But the whole point is that that relationship is itself non-teleological. Because if it's teleological, it's not intrinsically valuable or good. If the ground of reality is intrinsically valuable, then its value is not instrumentally expressed teleologically. Right. I get that. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. God is autotelic. Very much. And, you know, Wirilka says it, you know, in one of his great poems, that, like, you, and, and, and Eckhart and Angela Silesius, you know, the, you, you know, think that the living without a why is kind of the ultimate. I talked about this in the series. And, and part of what I think that means is again, that liberation from 
you know, the burdens of cosmic history um, in a very, very, very powerful way. Um, certainly what seems to be going on in the cloud of unknowing and other things the mystics report, they report a transcendence of that sort of enmeshment. Um, so it looks like the, maybe the, the difference we're getting at is uh, we can agree about this kind of teleology at the ground of being. We can even probably agree with this kind of teleology in the way that your colleague Dennis Walsh does and like apply it to different organisms and like maybe things that are very low on the hierarchy, like maybe, I, I don't know, would you agree with John, for instance, that we can say that there's a, there, there's this sense of teleology in the fact that let's say electrons will drive towards protons, for instance. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so that there, I mean, again, I think there, it, to say that is to say there's an intelligibility to things. It's to, to say there, there, is, there are reliable real relationships. This is the anti-nominalism, right? There are reliable real relationships mm -hmm. and all, every, any possible instrumental good or good for us that we can find is dependent on the, 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 the ontological independent uh, realness uh, and of that intelligibility. And, and, and so I, I would say all of that. Um, but then for me, I guess what, what I'm trying to say is that seems to now have gotten us very far, uh, uh, sorry, uh, for me, and I'm posing a question, that seems to be very far from the idea of redemptive teleology that we started this with. Um, I think it's going to be just like one layer up because you... <laughs> one layer I, up, wow. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> because, because you, I think you, I mean, with this sense of teleology, you could apply it to like individual humans, if, if I, if, or even groups, like groups can have this kind of teleology too, can't they? Like a group can be oriented towards winning the Stanley Cup or something. Well, well it, 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 you would be saying things like um, groups that organize in this way are much like, more likely to survive. So let's be clear that the kind of teleology that Dennis is talking about is the kind of teleology he thinks is expressed in natural evolution. Now, it's usually taken as, I mean, at least classically, natural evolution was taken as the great example of non-teleological uh, design, right? So that's what I said about, we have to be really careful about what we mean. Uh, it's like um, when I was talking to Sam about, yep. you know, the whiteness of the bear is conducive yep. to the, uh, the polar bear surviving, right? Yeah, exactly, and, and, and that sort of thing, exactly. Um, and so that I think it, 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 it's, is something, and again, this is deep and profound. This is not trivial. Like not like that, what Brian, uh, what, sorry, what Dennis is doing means real possibility, real constraint, taking intelligibility, real patterns, rejection of nominalism, right? Uh, really invoking, I would, I would argue, uh, you know, a dialectical vision, erigena, not Hegelian, of uh, emergence and emanation. This is all real. So this is an important you know, move that's happening in the philosophy of biology. I don't want, I, I, it's very important. Um, and if you're putting your finger on that, I think that's totally legitimate. But like, like I said, that doesn't seem to be the kind of teleology that's at home within narrative. It, 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 you know, John, when you were, when you were talking about your example, and, and this is often where I hear, where, where I watch this, you know, even when we're not speaking about teleological uh, teleology per se, but when I'm talking, you know, as a minister with people about, you know, believe in God, not believe in God, and very common parlance, the kind of stuff that I'll talk about with, you know, people who go to church or don't go to church, you know, people don't have philosophy degrees. This this inflection point, this teleological inflection point, I mean, I, I liked how you said it, JP, maybe another layer up, you know, we're, we, we'd like to win the Stanley Cup. Um, now, there's there's a sense of the, the purpose of that hockey team is to win the Stanley Cup. The purpose of that American football team is to win the Super Bowl. There's, there's that sort of built in, and we sort of map that onto, you know, the purpose of the polar bear is to, you know, is to hunt the seal and to reproduce and all of that. And, and, the, and, and you know, we're increasingly, I think, I think people are increasingly sort of comfortable 
you know, as you describe it, John, with that level of teleology, and it's the, the kind of teleology, if I think about it in sort of a story or mental picture, the kind of teleology that I find people where they sort of say, nope, not that one, is again, that there's some great mind that has conscious design for the universe that says we're going to arrive at this point together and for us to do this i got to make sure vander clay has his best arguments with john verveke so that you know <laughs> he can flip a lot of people from 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 skeptic to to churchgoers and i mean it's it's usually those kinds of stories and and when you when you said john too you know the the point of um you know that there's, there's no, and I hear this often, you know, there's, there's no, there's no God that's going to rescue us from climate change or from, you know, and any kinds of, because if there's, you know, we're certainly seeing potentiality as a, in yeah. terms of goodness, we're also seeing it in terms of evil. There's yeah. things we wish to avoid as well as, as well as things we wish to attain. And, and it's, and, and then the real, you know, a lot of the, the issue stalking our arguments is always, well, how, where, where are the, where are the gradients of this teleological thinking in terms of minds? You know, right now in America, we've got this, um, you know, debate about abortion that never ends. And, you know, I just listened to someone arguing that the the abortion is because men want to control women's bodies and i'm thinking what 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 mind possesses the motivation i mean we talk this way all the time as mm -hmm. if we have these you know now we're going to get into as if we have these spirits that are that are around and there's a there's an anti-abortion spirit whose motivation is to control women's bodies and and that's the spirit that is possessing you know, the legislature in the state of Texas or, you know, something like this. We, we, we use this language constantly mm -hmm. and, and, and it doesn't seem disconnected with a conversation like this because, no, I agree. you know, the, the, this team that is, that wants to win the Stanley cup. Um, where is that located and how now it's obviously located within the within the hockey players, it's located within the coaches, it's located within the fans, it's located in the, 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 those who own the team, it's located in the league. I mean, it's, it's, it's distributed all throughout here. And, you know, and, and part of what's been so, I think, part of what has invoked the meaning crisis in our culture is that we've recognized that at least in modernity, we sort of had it's secular modernity, we sort of had clear lines. And mm -hmm. we said, you know, beings with skin and breath have motivation. And we sort of, you know, excluded everything else from that kind of, of, of teleological behavior. And, and part of what we're recognizing is that teleology that we're seeing in the animals that Sam pointed out, how far does this scale up? And how immaterial is it when it comes to something like the stanley cup because there's there's obviously a mass and that that motivation is tied to status and now we're getting into jordan peterson lobsters and you know it, it's it's just we're just swimming in these things and and so then language of gods and you know powers those, and principalities yeah the, the only language we have available to us to try to account for whatever it is that is trying to control women's bodies by you know, resisting abortion or something like that. And I mean, what's so funny is that we, we live in this one world where we have all these arguments and everybody agrees. But then if you just pause and say, where's that motivation located? And, and how is it manifesting? And can we test it? And I mean, it's, it's just all strange. And so, you know, as we go through this, and I think about teleology, it's like, where is the teleology to win the Stanley Cup? And, and where does that come from? Okay, this, this is a really good point. Um, and I, I, I'm really savoring what you said, because I mean, I, I've been arguing for Dialogos, and you know, and, and 
the idea that distributed cognition has collective intelligence and that collective intelligence can uh, you know, sort of recurse back on itself and move towards collective wisdom. Uh, I take all of what you said very seriously. Uh, Chris and I, Christopher Mastin Pietro and I, in some of our articles, you know, we've talked about Geist, um, and and there's there, there's a worry associated with that word. Uh, you know, that that German word is great because it sits between mind and spirit uh, in in this really helpful fashion. It's how we get the Holy Ghost. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, and so I think your point that there, um, that there, there's distributed cognition that has a kind of agency and intelligence of its own and that in some sense solves problems and pursues goals. Uh, this is clearly the case. It's the collective intelligence of a bunch of individuals and a bunch of machine that navigates the ship, right? Um, um, and so if you're, and I think this is an excellent point. If you're saying, is it possible that, is it legitimate? Not is it possible? That's the wrong word. Is it legitimate? Because we're talking about justification here. Is it legitimate to talk about these upper level things using the language of spirits and gods? Um, and, and we're also talking about hyper objects like global warming and evolution is a hyper object, uh, right? Is it I possible? hate that term. Why object? I mean, it's a it's a hyper spirit. It's a spirit is what it is more than I mean, I think it's modernity that wants us to call it an object. Otherwise, we can't conceptualize it anyway. I'm sorry. I yeah, that the, the, it's, I know a, it's a borrowed term. Yeah, it's a it's it, it comes out of object oriented ontology. And there's a specific historical reason why, because they're trying to get out of subjectivity uh, right. as the as sort of the Cartesian frame, um, whether or not that's the most felicitous term. I don't know. They were also trying to, and, and don't make too much of this either, they were trying to sort of co-opt a metaphor of object-oriented programming and things like that. So there's a history there. Um, so I don't think we have to be that committed. But uh, let's acknowledge that, you know, talking about that, that, or I would go stronger, and you might not go this way, and, but, I, so, but I, this is me trying to acknowledge, so take it in that spirit, that when people have been talking about spirits and gods, that's exactly what they've been talking about. And that those are real, those are real entities, maybe a better word, real entities, real processes, real dynamical systems, et cetera. And, and um, I want to acknowledge all of that and that there could be a kind of teleology to them. The danger, uh, so uh, the risk is don't forget that that's a Hegelian term and Zeitgeist and Weltgeist are Hegelian terms and they gave us the bloody battle of Kursk, right? And so we have to be really, really careful about those teleologies. Um, and, and, and so I wanna acknowledge everything you said. Um, and I want to, um, I wanna say that I don't know if I would go Hegelian and see there being a unifying a geist of geists throughout all of history. Uh, Hegel tried to do that. And as I just said, that seemed to have gone disastrously bad in a lot of ways for all of his titanic brilliance. I think Hegel is to Protestantism what Thomas Aquinas is to Catholicism. Uh, so we- Ooh, I gotta write that one down. <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> um, and, and so um, I wanna acknowledge all of that. I wanna, uh, like I said, I, I don't know um, if that's gonna give you what you want, which is presumably a unified Geist. Um, um, it's interesting though, I could see an argument forming where you could make use of sort of the platonic notion of the one organizing all of the Geists in some geistly fashion. That would be interesting. No, the Neoplatonists did this very much. The forms were uh, thoughts in the mind of God and then that expressed itself in reality. So that what the move you just made, I think there is a very good move. It's a very dangerous move, like all good moves would be because uh, again, uh, you, there's direct linkage between these proposals of our uh, our uh, our reverence is that the right word for these guys and the kinds of genocides and horrific uh, warfare we've seen in human history. But I do think this is a terrifically good point, and I and I want to acknowledge, you know, this is this goes back to uh, you know earlier work that JP did trying to talk about those upper levels. The reason just to be clear about my earlier objections is that as you move up, 
to those. And this, I mean, so uh, uh, there's arguments for this and it, it is not um, a controversial thing. It is not an uncontroversial thing to say, but we seem to lose uh, consciousness as we move consciousness. In fact, one of the most intriguing things about consciousness is it seems to be limited to this very specific level. This is one of the classic problems that people like me try to explain and cognitive. Why only consciousness here? And J JP, I don't want to, I'm not trying to rain on your panpsychism, but right. And so Mo, so, and, and, and you'll find this, I hope humorous for the obvious reasons. Um, people who talk about this, uh, these higher levels, talk about them as zombie agents because they have a kind, yeah, there's the joke, they're zombie, right? But they have very much an intelligence and even a problem-solving capacity, and they may even be self-directing in some way, but it doesn't seem we can get independent evidence for them having an independent consciousness. Um, and, and I'd I, like to try uh, to, to, to use that. Um, this is because... wonderful. This is really, really juicy and good. I think with the, the, this kind of, I don't think I need much more than this kind of theology. I, after we spoke la last time, guys, I, I did read a few uh, of uh, Dennis's articles. I also really like the conversation, John, that you did with uh, Brett Anderson. I believe uh, if I get the name right. Yeah. And, and, and since then, I mean, it's been a few months and I've been trying to live out Christianity as close as possible to this notion of, of teleology. And I, I agree, for instance, that the what, the point you made earlier about Aristotle and Aquinas relying on the very strong notion of teleology, uh, but I don't think I need something that strong for me even to be able to read Aquinas. Uh, I don't think he, he needs to commit himself to something that strong because it's in the same way that once, I'm gonna try to use Dennis' sense of teleology. Um, let's say once the form of plant life emerges, then it conduces to the emergence of other plant lives. Yes. Uh, yes. Once the, yes. once. Makes possible. Yes, yes. very much. Yes. Yes. And like, same thing, once animal life emerges, it will also conduce towards the, the possibility of other animal lives. So once that form exists, then you can invoke a kind of theology towards more of that kind of life. And like, I think I just need like one more layer. <laughs> like after you get to the human with Christ, what I want to say is that once Christ emerges, once you have the crucifixion, like this pattern, this seed of, of, of the logo sacrificing himself to show the goodness of all of creation, like this seed is a new kind of life that conduces towards the emergence of more of that kind of life. Mm. So I get the kind of teleology, but I think I don't think I need something, let's say that's huge and top down coming down like you, the sense you get from Aristotle. I think I can get Easter with like maybe just one layer more than what you have in your ontology. It's well, the name of this video. Just one just one layer more. <laughs> Well, let me let me be annoying then, um, uh, yes. because I could take in the previous arguments. I think, including Tom Holland's argument, and say, no, no, all I need is that there was a superorganism formed um, that was able to change a civilization, namely the Christianity and the church, and it's like the team and the team, and there was a team spirit, and it moved through history, and all of this. It, to get back to the original point can be explained. I mean, this is part of my work in a completely naturalistic fashion. And, and, and that would account for the spreading argument. Uh, so what Paul posited, I think brilliantly, also it, 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 I, could, I could appropriate it and say, look, like, do we need anything beyond that, you know, the, the peak performance? That, no, that makes it sound artificial. The peak presence of this, uh, this super saint Jesus, seeded a new kind of Geist. And that is responsible for all of the things that you see in history and that that doesn't need anything other than that to explain it any more than I have to posit anything before or beyond the Geist of 
the crew and the machinery navigating the ship through the ocean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I can see that. I very much see that. I've had thoughts like that. I, here's a fun thing for you two. <laughs> Let's uh, just building on JP's one level more. I mean, think about think about what plants know of us. Think about mm. what the what the um, we'll use Midwestern, we'll use Iowa farmers. Think about what those all those Iowa corn stalks know of the farmer. And you know, there's a there's a teleological level above the corn stalk, but the corn stalk doesn't really know the farmer. Yeah. Um, and now let's let's level up now to the animals and sort of Aristotelian. What what do the animals know of us? I mean, the animals are sort of all going and and here are these you know these other creatures that come around and do things. And our dogs and our cats and our pets know of us you know a little bit. But I you know, my dog died not too long ago, and I don't always often watch this dog and think, what what am I in this dog eyed view of things? I'm this I'm this. But but he's got. My dog has a degree of consciousness, but I obviously have more consciousness. I've got way more teleology. I mean, that's why that's why we can play t- tricks on our pets because we're we're thinking a level ahead. But what we don't see them very well. And of course, then the next level up is you know as as ancients would have imagined. Well, there's you know in the way that the the the, the corn in Iowa doesn't see the farmer, we don't see we don't see the um, we don't see the consciousnesses of of those one, and we we don't even know how many levels up there are because not only does the the Iowa corn not see the farmer, it doesn't see the farmer's dog either. Um, and and in in many ways, it's kind of the you know the hints at you know you look at ancient cosmologies. This is very much the way they saw the world. And to go back to JP's primary and secondary causation. Um, yeah, that's you know, point. if I have a if I have a field and the grass is too high and I've got a couple goats, I put those goats and those goats are exercising their agency, eating up all that herbage that I'd like to have eaten. But I set the whole thing up, and what do those goats know of me? So <laughs> it's it's just you know just one level up. But 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 and the, the difficulty that we have, of course, is in some ways analogous to the to the difficulty of the corn or the difficulty of the pet. Now we obviously scale quite a bit dramatically. And again, the leap between the dog and me is a pretty significant leap. And of course, um, you know, evolution likes to suggest that, that that leap happened over time. And in a strange way, you know, the, the, the middle was hollowed out and um, all of our ancestors, you know, we, we ate our parents or at least plotted their, their genocide. But, um, you know, it's just, and, and then when you think about this in terms of teleological terms, well, the ancients would have been very comfortable with this idea because they'd look around and say, you know, Odysseus is doing the best he can to, you know, you know, work the gods against each other and work his favorites. And so I don't know, but, but then we get into, you know, we're sort of like, we're sort of like the, the stalks of corn saying, what are we here for? But they don't say that. The dog doesn't say that. We say that. And then are there levels up? If we can see levels below, are there more up? We don't know. So it's just a thought. Well, no, it's a good thought. And and, and there, there, I mean, I think we've already thought of thought about ways in which we're already even scientifically exploring these levels up and not just the levels down. Yeah. Uh, by the way, reductionism is anti-nominalist. Hmm. Just I just want to be clear about this. Just 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 to uh, Nominalism says there are no levels of realness. Reductionism says there are levels of realness. That's exactly what reductionism is. Reductionism and nominalism are inconsistent with each other. The fact that people put them together as if they happily go together is very problematic. It's the same way people think that neuroscience and artificial intelligence really sit together very well. No, they don't. Neuroscience says intelligence is dependent on having an organic brain. Artificial intelligence says, no, it's not. There's an inherent contradiction there. I teach my students this. I just want to be clear that we are already living in a multi-leveled. We just put reality at the bottom instead of on the top, but it's the same logical structure, just inverted. And so that's one of the reasons why I don't want to privilege emergence or emanation. Uh, So I I thought maybe you, you, you could appreciate that argument. So I think there's good reason for the levels up. I just gave the argument. 
Secondly, like I said, I think we're empirically studying this now. The whole idea of distributed cognition, collective intelligence, uh, collective uh, computation, all of this is, is powerful. The thing that um, is interesting, uh, you invoke the ancient tradition, but I'll invoke part of the ancient tradition too. And the ancient tradition is, you know, especially the Neoplatonic tradition, is very clear that those upper levels don't have consciousness because of the inherent way in which consciousness is bound to time, it's divided against itself, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. I mean, and this, these are classic arguments by Plotinus and others. So the, the ancient tradition is very, very uh, ambivalent about uh, whether or not there's consciousness. There's good reasons. I mean, you, you can, I mean, Dionysus will say things like, you know, God doesn't think. God doesn't not think either. And then you go, what the heck is he talking about? Right, uh, right. Uh, and so, so I'll, 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 I just wanted to respond at that point. I want to give something again, because this I think is something you could say, whether or not, so well, instead of maybe an argument from ancient tradition, because I think that's kind of ambivalent. Here's something you could say, Paul, maybe on your behalf. And if you don't like it, of course you can, you can, you can disavow it. Distributed, this is an argument that Dan Chiappi and I have made about how the scientists and the rovers together are able to study the hyper object that is Mars and its atmosphere and its, and its history. That hyper objects can only be grasped by distributed cognition. There are things that are, only, problems that are only solvable and in that sense knowable by distributed cognition that are not solvable or knowable by us. Global warming, nobody knows global warming. You can only study global warming with hundreds of scientists, tons of machines, tons of computers, all in this vast complicated network. That's the entity that can know about global warming. And so I think you could say, right? One of the things you could say to me is, well, isn't it plausible that right, this, uh, these, up, these the, the hyper entities, what, right, uh, right? They, 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 they know. I'm still not giving them consciousness, but they know and they solve, right? Problems that we can't solve. I think that's very plausible. But then, my response to that would be, that strengthens my previous point that maybe the entity that, right, is ultimately responsible for the spreading is the church and the things that only the church knew. I mean, isn't this one of the dividing things between Protestants and Catholics? And I'm not trying to get you guys against each other, but the idea of the church and the tradition, the, the tradition is basically the distributed cognition of the church, ha having, right, having a kind of knowledge that the individuals within the church don't know. I mean, that was, that was at least a, a claim made by the Catholic church. So I'm not, I mean, sorry, Paul, I don't mean to be, Protestants right. deny it, but they act as if they have a church. <laughs> well, that's honest. It's an invisible church. <laughs> but I mean, both Eastern Orthodox and Catholicism do. So I'm not invoking something totally foreign is what I'm saying. I, 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 I get what you're saying, Paul, and I'm trying not to be in any way insulting to Protestants, but I'm just trying to say that what I'm saying, you know, the body of Christ, the church, the tradition, yep. Yep. right? They're, they're, it's got precedence. It's got precedence within Christian theology itself. I'd like to try to respond to that because I'm, since we started speaking, John, like over two years ago now, I've come to not need panpsychism anymore. It's yep. not like, it's not like I found new counter arguments to the arguments I had at the time, but I find that I don't need them anymore. Like I don't need to ascribe consciousness to groups or um, yep. even God if I have the classical Christian Neoplatonist hierarchy where like as long as I have real patterns above, I can use analogies to talk about those real patterns and ultimately about the ground of all patterns, but I don't need exactly consciousness. And so this is sort of one side of the question, but the other one, John, when you ask, well, sort of why do we need something more than naturalism to, with, with the one more layer argument I was trying to bring out? Because if, if I just need one more layer to naturalism, I conceivably end up with another kind of naturalism. So why, like, why, why do I need supernaturalism or something else? And over time, I, I don't know if I can say that. I, 
In the same way that Christians could adopt Neoplatonism and be Christian Neoplatonists, I, I feel like uh, today I could almost say that I'm a Christian naturalist, but in your sense of naturalism, uh, because I really don't think your ontology is so rich, John, that it seems like it, it, I've been surprised over the discussions that we had where I would bring something like higher level consciousnesses or I would bring out the, say, the incarnation and you're able to sort of gobble up those things in your ontology and like, uh, oh. like. <laughs> <laughs> gobble up. I, hope that I, <laughs> I mean, I'm trying. Well, part of it is I take seriously what both of you have said to me. I mean, you're, you're thank you for saying that. That was a compliment and, and a deep one and I appreciate it. Uh, but I, I, I also want to return the credit. I mean, if, I mean, these you have also informed and trans both of you constantly are informing and transforming my thinking. I wouldn't be like I, I don't know if I would. I, re, I'm reading this entire history of Christian Platonism. Like here's mystical monotheism, a study in ancient Platonic theology by John Peter Kenny. I wouldn't be reading that. I'm sure if I hadn't you know, form friendships with the two of you and entered into dialogue. So I think it's very much reciprocal. Uh, and, 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 you know, and, I, and I'm, I hope you take this in the right way. I'm trying to push naturalism as far as it can go to accommodate. I mean, I'm, I'm even trying to accommodate, you know, the church and, and, and its mission and its, and its spirit um, in a naturalistic framework. Uh, to try and um, so I'm trying to say that I'm doing that because I'm responding to very good points, uh, and, and not just very good points, um, very good people and, and very good lives, and uh, and so that, that's how I want to respond to what you just said. Um, it's really beautiful. It it brings back something we also talked about two years ago about existential risks, because it really feels like I, I'm sort of I sort of try to rest on your position. Like to try to, okay, I take John's position to be a very stable Neoplatonist naturalism. And I try to sort of stand on it to explore deeper into Christianity. And then I come back to you with like some attempts and then we discuss and hopefully we get closer and we both get higher. But I, I still think that the, the idea of existential risk is maybe what distinguishes the both of us here where I'm willing to take some yeah. risks of, okay, I'm gonna go with like, Jesus really rose from the tomb and there are saints today who can really do miracles. And I, like, I'm, I'm willing to sort of take that step and then come back down and see how this intersects with naturalism. And like the sort of the trajectory that has been unfolding through this gives me a lot of hope and like faith in, in that path. And, and I think one of the things I hope is the demonstration that that path is and I mean this deeply, is intellectually respectable. I, I mean, that, that's one of the things I'm trying to show here, right? That you are willing to take a certain kind of existential risk that I'm not, but, right, you, like, I'll use your metaphors. You go up and then come down and then we dialogue and then that changes. And th I think it's, it's, it changes in a genuinely dialogos. It changes in a way in which there's more intelligibility afforded to more people on a more reliable basis. So I think all of that is the case. And like, and your adjective is one I agree with. I think it's beautiful. And I think it's beautiful in an important way. Um, I, 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 I think that, I, 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 I think highly of both of you and I respect you and, and the honesty and the willingness to enter into genuine conversation. And so, and I've said this before, I have no final foreclosure argument that says, don't take that risk. You're, you're stupid to take that risk. I don't do that because I don't think such arguments exist, right? I do what I do. I come in here in honesty, offer you my best, listen to your best and try to be as responsible and as responsive as I can. But, you know, Socratic humility, you know, I don't know ultimately if, the risk you're taking is right or wrong. And uh, I, so I might, I have to follow the truth, as, the logos as I best see it, as Socrates would say, and follow it wherever it goes. And then what, where I can't follow you that way, what I hope I can do is offer you friendship and support so that 
if that existential risk turns out to be correct, I at least helped you live it. That's the best I can do. That's beautiful. I, I, I guess I'd just like to add to uh, JP's shocking admission of a Christian naturalist. I, I think <laughs> I think naturalism is in fact the you know a daughter of Christianity, and I I get there by sort of taking some Tom Holland and some Owen Barfield, mm -hmm. because you know when Tom Holland begins Dominion, he doesn't start in the first century; he starts with the Hebrew prophets, mm -hmm. because when those Hebrew prophets say your gods are stock and stone, well. They're sort of early predecessors of, 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 you know, some spirit of new atheism in some way back there. Very much, very much. That's totally true. That's and totally and true. that and and when Jesus says, "Hey, you know what? It's not what you put into your body that makes you unclean. It's what's coming out of your heart." Um, you know, this is all through, and this is all through the Hebrew prophets, and then into Christianity, and and this is in stark contrast to, you know the pagan world and the greeks are also kind of weird out there and so these yeah. these two weirdnesses sort of found each other and <laughs> yeah so you know we're not i mean these are we're really talking different you know extensions of this of this vast tree that have been growing and drawing the connections together and um and so i i i also you know deeply enjoy this because the truth is that you know for all of us these questions these doubts it, the 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 you know, for very short-lived, fragile creatures to ask risk questions are is yeah. a big deal, and and it gets down to you know the 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 pastoral question. You say, you know, is 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 anyone going to rescue me? And and I would also add, in terms of the in in terms of the 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 reason for horrendous human behavior throughout history. Much of that are Christian people saying, God isn't rescuing me from my enemy. It's time to preemptive strike and wipe them all out. Mm. I mean, that motivation is in there too, yeah, in that yeah, being, yeah, being our own savior. And that's in Protestant theology and, and Reformed theology. A big part of our problem is we're our own savior and Lord. And so then when I suddenly have the rights of God, I have the right to take my neighbor's life. And so th these are, these are, these are long conversations that that map, and it's 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 just really um, inspiring for me to watch both of you bring in Nishitani and and some of these even arguments further out in terms of world history, and it's exciting about the future. Yeah, I, I, I'm sort of done. <laughs> oh, it's late for you guys. <laughs> uh, but. Um... I also feel like we've come, I mean, we we're not in final agreement, but we didn't think we would end there. But I, I also feel this was genuine dialogos. I got to places I wouldn't have got to on my own. Seems that the two of you had that happen too. And um, so I, I just wanted to thank both of you. I think this was, was great. Well, thank you, John. And yes, thank, thank you, you, JP, for writing these pieces that keep us going. <laughs> and, and again, for anybody who's just listening to this, read JP's stuff linked below here. It's, it's, I'm very impressed by it, JP. It's, it's, really it's not to summarize, yeah. You can do things in writing that would take like two hours to, to explain verbally. So oh, very yeah. much, very, very much. That's yeah. very much the case. Yeah. Right. So uh, maybe we can stop the recording here. <laughs>